Thank you guys. Thanks for coming here, probably to what I think is one of the most exciting sessions um, here at reInvent. Um, uh, in case you missed this morning, because you were too drunk from last night, um, I'm Werner Fogels, I'm the CTO of Amazon, and I'm really proud uh, to host this session. So what will happen, there's five brand new young companies who are running on AWS, who are going to present here today. So what's going to happen, they're going to do a five minute pitch, and then I'll come back on and I'll kind of ask them the most horrible question they ever had. Um, and then we'll go on to the next one. Yep. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's start off with uh, Mark Rivington, the VP of Product of Boundary. Good cheers, Mark. I like your shoes. Please. Go ahead. Thank you very much. It's a real privilege and honor to be here. Um, my name is Mark Rivington. For those people who know me but don't recognize me right now, it's because I'm sporting this rather mean mustache for November. I recommend that you all uh, support that charity. OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, a product that we're launching. Uh, first of all, I just want to introduce you to Boundary. Who are Boundary? We're kind of the pioneers in uh, application monitoring at the one second level. Uh, we have a service that's in production right now and it's used by a lot of really uh, well-known companies. And they need uh, you know, to know when issues happen. They need to know within seconds. And they like to know about uh, performance metrics down to the one second granularity. So it really matters to them. Most of them are running in AWS, right? And uh, we've been giving them this great monitoring service. They said, why don't you do something about AWS itself? So today, in front of you, I'm now launching Boundary for AWS. Imagine. <laughs> Thank you. I really envy physical product people because they can hold the product in their hand and wave it about. OK, so Boundary for AWS is basically monitoring AWS using CloudWatch as the source of metrics, but doing more than CloudWatch, basically supercharging CloudWatch. CloudWatch is great, but if you want uh, you know, customizable dashboards, you want to bring in metrics from other sources as well and then mix and match with your CloudWatch, you want to retain it longer, all the good reasons that uh, you'd want uh, a boundary for AWS. And it's so easy. All you have to do is register, put in your credentials. It's even easier than one, two, three. It's as easy as one, two. OK? Very simple. No software required. But what does it give you? Uh, I'll just briefly go through the things it would give you. It gives you source selection capability, filtering, custom dashboard building. You can do instant point in time deep dives, you know, which are my top uh, end users of data or in, out, or CPU, or whatever else. And you can slide easily back and forwards in time. And you can get some derived metrics as well. Uh, it comes out of the box with predefined uh, dashboards. So you know, uh, access to all of your AWS metrics, dashboards for the services that you're running, you can also do alerts at will across all of these metrics, and then you can share with everybody. You can share these dashboards out to anybody in the world. They don't have to be boundary users. So you can collaborate across organizations. Just simply click on the share, and away you go. But what it brings together is affect CloudWatch, Amazon services, and all of the other web scale IT technology that you're using. I mean, we are an AWS customer. We actually run this on AWS. Uh, we use AWS. I have to admit that we didn't, but we're recovering bare metal uses. And we're now uh, running on AWS. And now it's so much easier to scale things up. You can actually make mistakes with your sizing and then fix it immediately. And we actually have a much better control over the costs, something my CEO is very keen of as a startup. You know, if you buy a bare metal box that costs you $800 a month, and it sits around at 10%, there's nothing you can do about it. You just wasted a lot of money. So it's really good. We found being on AWS is really, really useful. So I'm just going to give you a little brief view of Boundary, live demo, except it isn't live. It's a movie. Uh, so <laughs> and it's, you have to look at it for a while to realize that actually what you're getting is one second updates. And I'm looking at my HBase data cluster. And I'm seeing the updates coming in. And then you know, I may decide that actually I want to do something else. You know, I may actually want to go and look at my HBase master cluster. And look, you know, I see these massive peaks. You know, I can see clearly now. Uh, I sometimes want to burst into song when I say that. 
I don't know, Werner, if you remember Johnny Nash, 1972, the great uh, hit, I can see it clearly now. It's, um, I bet you never knew that H Bass Master, sorry, you're two years younger than me. <laughs> okay, so that's just a brief test, a uh, brief uh, taster of what it is. So, so what I want to announce as well today, special offer for all of you, everybody at the show, is free forever boundary for AWS. We're not going to charge you one cent for this. We're giving it away free forever. Uh, you know, we're going to limit you to 10 million metrics per day. That's a very big number. I mean, we already do millions and millions of metrics a second, so we can generously give you 10 million a day. OK, come to the booth, uh, chat to our sales, salesy type guys. I mean, they're not selling you anything. They're giving it to you. And then when you come to the booth, you can also win this rather dubious device, which is a drone that actually has a camera on it, and you can film your neighbors in the backyard <laughs> if you really have to. Thank you. That's an absolutely magnificent offer. Yeah? So um, who is actually keeping the metrics? Is we, it just to pull it, let's say, historical-wise, do you pull it out of CloudWatch, or is this also something that you guys are storing yourself? We pull it out of CloudWatch, and we store it in our uh, NoSQL database. OK, SQL. so that means that one second resolution, that's an enormous amount of data yep. for those customers. So how can you afford that? Wow, that's magic, isn't it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> We can't tell you that. But yeah, we do. I mean, is it? Are you running Cassandra? Are you stored in DynamoDB? Open TSDB. Open TSDB. Open TSDB. OK. Yeah. Time series data. Good. All Thank right. you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Let me now introduce uh, Dar Lajor on stage of Claudius. Hi. Take it away, Dar. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vegas. I wanted to say that. So, My name is Dor, I'm a CEO and co-founder at Cloudia Systems, and guess what? I'm here to talk about the cloud. So our mission is simple, to provide the best OS powering virtual machines in the cloud. Now when I say OS, it is an operating system. It's our own kernel that we write ourselves. So it's called OSV. OSV is a server OS designed to run on top of virtual machines only. Unlike other operating system, this is its sole reason for existence. We wrote the kernels from, from scratch. It runs on an NMI on top of AWS. It was written by the KVM team, which I'm pretty proud to be part of. It's the fastest, it's more, most efficient OS out there. And it's the also the easiest to manage. Let's dive in. So as I was explaining, OS3 runs as a regular NMI. It can also run on any different other cloud and other hypervisors. Uh, we run common workloads like uh, JVM, Node.js, Tomcat, NoSQL, etc. cetera. Uh, it's very exciting for us today because after two years of development, we announced our beta release. Uh, we have two offerings. A, off-the-shelf applications, those applications that I was just mentioning. mentioning. B, an extreme I.O. program where you can build our build, use our building blocks and build multi-million IOPS machines. Now, you probably ask by, by self, you ask yourself, why a new OS? So along with the shift towards the cloud, there has been a trend away from monolithic J2E servers towards microservices architecture. The result is that the application is a small chunk of the whole stack, while the OS contains the most. Um, I.O. takes the most time in traversing all of, all of these layers with a lot of configuration file in the OS, much more than the application itself. OS management becomes a pain. Just think for yourself how much time you divide between managing your infrastructure than your, your application. So let's talk about the OSV approach, which is a library OS-based approach. We embrace the cloud notion of single application per server. So our, our OS can run just one single application, but it runs it unlike any other OS. Within the AMI, there is a kernel, a runtime, and your application. That's it. In fact, 
it's a two file OS. We have zero configuration files. There are zero contact switches between user space and kernel space. And why? Because we transparently load the application into the kernel space. That's why we can do also zero copy I.O. and other fancy features. So after we covered the basic design, let's talk about what matters. Value. So it's twofold. In terms of performance, for example, unmodified Redis performs 50 to 80% faster with OSV than on Linux. If you use our kernel APIs, like we've done with the memcache, you can achieve two to four times better, actually faster than physical machines. The second and not as important value proposition is manageability and ease of use. We embrace the notion of stateless OS being immutable. So in our OS, everything is built on top of REST API. You can meddle the um, memory internals, the JVM, uh, file upload, upgrades, etc. basically anything. And you can customize uh, your building box using our CLI and our GUI. Everything is tied together using the cloud in it. So this is where we keep our state. And when we boot, we pull the state from it. And this is how we keep the state. Along with it, we have data partitions with ZFS file system of our own running within the guest. We love the Docker concept too. We're not Docker, but we embrace some of the Docker ideas. So we have a centralized image, image repository for our VMs. Our VMs are as small as 20 megabytes because it's just a kernel and a runtime. That's it. Check for yourself. You can build it in three seconds and boot it under a single second. We love AWS, and we eat our own dog food, so I'd like to share it with you. Uh, our image repository called Capstone is re resides on F3. We extensively use continuous integration to test OS development. We run hundreds of tests on any given instance site each day. We use CloudFormation to set up complex networking uh, uh, setups, and we tie everything up through CloudInit and also through CloudWatch to provide the best out-of-the-box experience. Lastly, we have a special offer for you today, and this week you'll have to register for that. Uh, we have a new AMI coming. It's called Flash Cache. Flash Cache is an extension of our already outrageously fast memcache. It utilizes the SSD, and thus not only you have superior through throughput numbers, but also you have extended capacity, and you'll be able through it to shrink down your cluster size by a factor of four. So I highly encourage you to test this out and register. Uh, we're in booth K14. It's actually a kiosk. We're thinner. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. So given that this is a library OS, one of the first and most important tasks of an OS is failure isolation. Mm -hmm. yeah? But if you run everything in one process, you don't get that, fi fi that failure isolation. So uh, why did you make this decision to go with a library OS? Because does it mm -hmm. mean that all the applications have to be Java applications that can run in there, or can any application run? Uh, basically, all, almost every application is, can run on top of OSV. Uh, part of the reason that enabled us to, to uh, have I failure isolation is because of you guys. Because uh, the hypervisor is the best source for multi-tenancy. That's the right layer to do the virtualization, not within the kernel, but within the hypervisor, so that, that's true. And uh, we can run, not, we started with JVM, but we expanded towards other runtime because it just worked for us, and we were happy to clone the, the good experience with JVM. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Josh. Josh Tella, the CEO of Luminal. Thank you. Hi, I'm Josh Stella, co-founder and CEO of Luminal, and I'm here to introduce you to our first product, Fugue. In music, a fugue is a repetition of simple phrases layered one over top of another and repeated and evolved over time to create some of the most beautiful and sophisticated musical compositions humans have ever created. Similarly, our fugue, fugue computing, is the automated creation 
and regeneration of your compute infrastructure and resources over time to allow immutable infrastructure patterns for operational simplicity, efficiency, and better system fidelity. So I'm going to show you a short video. So, Fugue is immutable infrastructure realized simply and automatically now. You've heard Werner talk for a couple of years about paper cup computing. You might have seen Martin Fowler writing about Phoenix computing, where your servers should be burned down and completely rebuilt rather than maintained in situ. Or Chad Fowler talking about immutable architecture, these same basic patterns. Fugue, allows a, a, Fugue is a solution for all those patterns now. Cloud needs an operating system for the same reason individual systems needed an operating system years ago. You just heard about some revolutionary work going on at the instance level. We're talking about the cloud level. So you need the equivalent of a kernel on the cloud, something that creates, manages, allocates resources for, destroys, and regenerates all of the process equivalents, being compute instances in your cloud, a source of trust. And that same thing needs to know everything that's running in your cloud environment and the infrastructure, a source of truth. Those things belong together. So Fugue is built on AWS. AWS is the best platform in history for building new, exciting technologies. We heavily use the entire AWS stack. We use EC2 for the conductor. Fugue runs completely in your infrastructure, by the way. There's no SaaS. There's no phoning home. This is software you run built using the Unix philosophy. We use S3 buckets for transporting code securely. All communication between uh, any part of the stack is done via SQS. So there are two main components to Fugue. The first is a declarative compiled language, a simple DSL to program in, basic functional properties, a declarative language called Ludwig. It's important to have compilation so that you can check for errors at build time rather than at runtime. And then our conductor, which is the equivalent of the kernel, again, it's a T2 micro instance running in your account that builds and manages your entire cloud infrastructure. We're not given a lot of time up here, so I'm going to have to rush through a lot of the rest of this. But on, on the screen here is our prototype GUI uh, and some Ludwig code. You can see in a couple lines of code, I can define a venue that's a complete instance of your application. Another line of code, I've added two sections to it. That's web servers and application servers. A few more lines of code reusing the code from development, and I can build a production venue. Then I can reference external resources that are not fugued like RDS. So the fugue conductor is building everything in this infrastructure, ELB, security groups, uh, IAM roles, all of your compute instances, and then regenerating them on the schedule that you provide. So in this instance, we're regenerating web servers every hour without any impact to your users. 
So Fugue is immutable infrastructure realized. We're launching in beta this week at reInvent. We have a great special offer for you. If you sign up for the Fugue beta at fugue.it this week, you will get all of 2015 basic Fugue for free, no matter your scale if you're running 10 instances or 10,000 instances. Please come by the booth 650 right by the Dev Lounge later this afternoon. I'll be there, and I'll be here uh, for the rest of the session. And thank you very much. Very cool stuff, immutable infrastructure. Um, how did, so I understand how the dependencies of all the different pieces work. How do customers write their client code? I mean, the application code itself. Um, for example, if you were, could I run Nginx in that, or do I have to really rewrite my web server from scratch? Oh, certainly not. Anything you can run on an AME, you can run in Fugue. Okay, so it is the management of it that is immutable, not the code itself. You don't have to write new client code. That's right. You don't have to yeah. write new client okay. code. It is all the, 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 the declarative stuff is all about the dependencies between the different components. That's right. We're operating at the infrastructure level and even to the degree where language primitives reflect AWS infrastructure primitives. Okay, cool. Very cool, man. Thanks. Thank you. Pleasure. Uh, next, next up is Chip Wilcox, um, the CEO from Temasis. Temasis, sorry. Temasis. Thank you. Good. Nice That's to sure. see you, man. Okay. Um, I'm Chip Wilcox. I'm the CEO from Temasis. Uh, we're based in Singapore, and I'm here to tell you about how we're ready to help you build a web that communicates. So today, you may be familiar with the idea that there are lots and lots of different ways that people can communicate. One challenge that we have with this is that these are all standalone solutions for that. A lot of them are based on legacy technologies that are 15 to 20 years old. Um, many of them are intentionally keeping their users in walled gardens so that they can't communicate across boundaries. We think that that's actually a huge opportunity for us, and we're working with a new technology called Web Real-Time Communications, which we believe defines the future of real-time interactions. We're seeing an evolution, if you want to call it a revolution, as I do sometimes, where the world is moving from a place where you have on-premises hardware-based installations that cost a lot of money and require a lot of uh, management, if you want to call it that. We've moved from that to software as a service and mobile applications that do things across a much wider range of devices. Now we're working towards an area where WebRTC provides the capacity to do embeddable contextual real-time interactivity across any web application or mobile device. So what we're talking about today is Temesis and our Skylink platform, which we propose as a complete solution for working with WebRTC. The WebRTC Foundation API is really great, but to make it work for everyone, we think that it's important to provide really easy-to-use, developer-friendly, client-side tools that make it possible to build, test, and deploy real-time communications as a feature in your applications within hours, if not days. You also have to provide a way to scale quickly, and that's accomplished by our efforts to provide telco-grade enterprise-ready infrastructure to handle signaling, NAT traversal, all the complicated things that you really don't want to worry about if you want to focus on your users and the experience that you're providing them in your application. And of course, we provide a robust developer engagement program that helps you all learn how to use what we provide and WebRTC to make the most of that. And we're ready today. We're already seeing applications of our technology in places like contact centers, telehealth, collaboration, gaming, and a few other places like financial services. But frankly, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you're interested in providing real-time interactivity, embedded in any application across the web or on mobile devices, we can help you. We're also global with some unique insights that we get from having come from Asia Pacific. I like coming back to the United States where internet bandwidth and wireless connections work like lightning, but we actually have optimized our entire stack to support markets where maybe internet bandwidth isn't so great. What if you have to do a video call over satellite? Well, we can help you with that. 
Whereas if you try and use some other applications that we may all be familiar with, you can pretty much be assured that you're not going to have a great experience. And how do we do all of that? Well, I really think that it's possible because of Amazon Web Services. And basically, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. We use many different types of services from Amazon. The reason for that being is really the optimization capability and the cost savings that we get from doing that. I'll take the uh, elastic hash uh, component of our signaling or even our MCU media server, which we built just for WebRTC. There are other services that work great that run on top of AWS. But with Elastic Hash, we get to configure at a much more fine level of granularity the things that we need to do to make it work the way we need it to work in our markets and across the globe. So today, here at AWS reInvent, we'd like to make anyone that signs up for our service today or this week, uh, we'll give you three months of free usage and that's after we start charging for the service. Today we're in public beta and the usage of our platform is completely free. When we start charging, we're going to follow the AWS model where you have a freemium level and then of course you pay for what you actually use. When you scale, that's when you start to incur those costs and we participate in your success. And there's one more thing. We're also going to be following up and anyone that registers this week, we're going to enter you into a contest to see who can build the best live implementation or integration using the Skylink platform. And there's some pretty cool things going on here. If you've never been to Singapore, this is your chance. <laughs> so on top of that, everyone that we see that participates in this contest will offer free consultation. And if you win, we'll try and take it one step further. You can work one-on-one -on -one with us to see how you can best optimize your app and get it to scale. Thanks very much for letting us speak today. That's, that's an amazing offer, by the way. It's great. <laughs> and um, if you want to go to Singapore, it's cool to go there. Um, WebRTC is a standard. Mm -hmm. yeah? So do standard WebRTC-enabled applications, can they immediately connect to your network? Or do, um, new, do applications actually need to load new libraries or load your specific uh, materials? We provide some components that's a, that are very generic. So for example, WebRTC isn't supported in Internet Explorer and Safari today. What we've done is we've made a component that allows that to happen in, in any application, not just ones that are built on our platform, okay. as a service to make it possible for people to adopt WebRTC when they need to. On the other hand, we also make it very easy for people to build and deploy using our stack. So transforming your application from another provider to what we do okay. is very, very easy. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank Thanks you very for your much. Time. Pleasure. Thanks. <clears throat> Pretty cool stuff. Now, uh, let me ask uh, Jen André uh, on stage, founder and chief scientist, and Chris Gervais. Very good. Gervais. Gervais. Ah. Ah. <laughs> VP of engineering of Stack. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are you French? We oui. no. We? Oui? Yeah. Hey guys, so thanks for having us. I hope everyone's doing well. I know when I'm in Vegas for two days, it feels like I've been here for like a week, so hopefully we'll get through this and be able to drink and relax. Um, so I'm Jen Andre, I'm the chief scientist at ThreatStack, and this is Chris, our VP of Engineering. Um, we came all the way from Cambridge, Massachusetts to tell you about our product, and this is also our big launch week. Um, we've been in private beta for a while, and we're really excited to tell you about our kind of security monitoring solution. So we wanted a security monitoring solution that was simple to deploy, kept our systems protected, and generally got security out of our way. So we built basically the security monitoring solution that we wanted to use. And that's Chris. So I'm going to tell a story that's probably familiar to a few of you out there in the audience. Um, so good news. Your business is growing. The, of course, mm. the icons aren't working. Um, it's doing well. And you're taking advantage of more and more Amazon infrastructure so you can accommodate all the new customer workloads you're bringing on board. However, with this new growth, there's a lot more to worry about. Um, you need to make sure that your systems are protected against data loss and intrusion, not only for your sake, but also for the sake of your customers. So that begs the question, how do you know you're protected when you're growing fast? So we've probably all seen this diagram. Um, 
It's the shared security model. And basically what it's saying is that Amazon takes care of securing the base layer of your infrastructure for you. However, we as security teams, operations teams, and development teams are responsible for answering the tough questions. Questions about the robustness of our code, the reliability of our infrastructure, and whether or not we're living up to our part to make sure that our customer data is protected. So everyone remembers the Shellshock vulnerability. Um, Shellshock was a really big deal because it affected so many Linux servers and it was so easy to exploit. So how did you know if you had EC2 instances that maybe were gone now but were compromised a week ago? Um, or how about this? You have an ops guy, Bob, who lives in California. However, he appears to be logging into your jump host from somewhere in Pakistan. Is this something you should be concerned about? Or is it probably fine? Um, so we built ThreatStack to answer these types of questions, and Chris here is going to show you exactly how we did it. Thanks, Jim. All right. So we built ThreatStack around three simple organizing principles. Visibility, like you've never had it before into your systems. Ease of use, you can deploy this thing super quickly, capture data, and see it in ways that you've never had before, and scale out, right? Of course, we're all here for, uh, for the AWS conference, and we love Amazon because we're running on Amazon as well, and it allows us to scale super quickly. So a little bit about that. So today, we are running our entire backend on Amazon. We were born there, like many of you, taking advantage of awesome services that allow us to scale, and we've got a huge chunk of our infrastructure uh, that we just brought up for production across multiple AZs. The other benefit is that we're integrating with Amazon, which I'm going to show you in a minute, that, so customers can get a much clearer view of their security posture of their infrastructure. All right, so let's dive in and check this thing out. So getting started is super simple. We ship a very sophisticated but lightweight agent that you install in your instances. All you got to do is click a button. We give you a script. You can deploy that yourself. You can use it with Chef or Puppet, your configuration management tool of choice, and you are off to the races. Once you do that, we start collecting all of the data. The dashboard brings it all together for you in a nice, easily consumable way. The agents act like a security camera recording everything that's happening on your systems so you can see what's right and what's not right, what's normal and what's anomalous. But if we go under the hood, that's where the really good stuff is. So we show you things like a TTY replay session. We've got basically a DVR built in here so you can see what happened on your systems. We'll show you awesome process details so you can find out what's running, what's talking to what, and what should be or shouldn't be. You can watch your key files and directories to make sure that if anyone's touching your secret keys, you're going to know about it really quickly. Finally, you can tie all this together with alerting and monitoring. Integrating with AWS is really easy. Go in, create an AIM role for us, create your profile in ThreatStack, and then boom, we bring in all your instances, show you what's covered and what's not. You can leverage your tags, and you can manage all of your coverage in one place. There's a whole bunch more stuff in here that I'd love to talk to you about, but we don't have time. As you grow with ThreatStack, we grow with you. And there's a lot of awesome capabilities in here that I'd love for you to check out. So even though we launched today, we've been in beta for a while, and we've got customers who are already on board with us. And they've given us great feedback about how we've been protecting their systems. And we'd really like to thank them, because they've given us just awesome feedback over the summer and the early fall, which has gotten us to this point. So. Go to threatstack.com slash reinvent today. Start to sign up. Come by our booth, 742. Win a Fire TV. Do the drawing. Get an awesome t-shirt. I, I got props today because we got such awesome American Apparel t-shirts. Uh, also, we're doing a special offer just for reinvent. So since we are live and we've got paying customers today, if you buy 10 agents, we're going to give you one free. Uh, so that's for the lifetime of the agent. So come by, sign up, go to the website, talk to any of us. We're happy to give you more insight into this great solution. Thank you very much for having us. So now, now the nasty question. It's, uh, to me, it appears as if your agent would be the ideal place for me to attack a node. Right. Yeah? Because you have access to everything. So how do you prevent your, uh, your agents from becoming actually the vulnerability in the system? Uh, we do things that a lot of security companies do with their agents, right? We make sure we have correct privilege separation. So we have multiple small processes. And if this process doesn't need root access, for example, we don't give it the access that it needs to actually monitor. We give it only the access it needs to monitor stuff. Okay. So um, yeah, and basically, 
the other cool feature about our thing is like we're shipping stuff off in real time. So let's say someone does get root on your box, and basically once you have root, you can do things to hide yourself, but you know, at that point it's game over. They can do whatever they want, they can find you and kill you. But we're shipping stuff off in real time, so that means when they see your agent get shut off, they can go back and look at the audit log and see, oh shit, something bad happened. We okay. better go take a look at that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Okay. Ha. Ah. Let's do some brand marketing here. Yeah. I'm Dutch. So, uh, guys, thank you all for, um, for coming here uh, this afternoon. Uh, there's an open bar in a minute. Um, but if you actually attended any of these um, startup sessions uh, here this afternoon and you got a stamp here, um, please go to the swag station just outside the hall for a special gift. And otherwise, guys, cheers. And please join us at the party tonight. Yes.